one person. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming to see my talk. So this is uh, a talk about the journey that I took to buy an ATM, uh, not working for a bank or any kind of financial organization at all. And I liken it to the opening titles of the French, uh, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, which goes. And this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. That just gives you a bit of a taster. <laughs> so for those of you that might know, um, I made a trailer for this security conference, and I'm going to play it for everyone now who hasn't seen it. It just gives you a bit of a taster of the kind of things you're going to see. So. Hello, my name is Leanne Galloway. You'll probably also know me as the woman that found the vulnerability in MySpace in 2017, an extra to host unknown, or a well-decorated security professional in my own right. But enough about me, this is a different story. You're probably wondering why I have an ATM. If you want to learn more about how I bought an ATM, you'll have to come and see my talk. So let's talk a bit about the benefits of owning an ATM. Here in no particular order are my top five reasons to own an ATM. One, you don't need to go to the bank anymore. Two, it'll make you very popular with the media. Three, the kids will love it. You can take it to security conferences. Five, you can have your own pyrotechnic display right outside your door. <laughs> So that was just a little intro into how, oh, what you can do with an ATM. So this starts before I joined uh, the company I'm currently working at. So I work for a company called Positive Technologies, which you may or may not have heard of. And this journey to buy an ATM started in February of this year. So in February of this year, uh, our internal PR representative came up with a brilliant idea for InfoSec 2017. He said, I've read an article online that suggests that if you buy components of an ATM from eBay, you can construct an ATM. <laughs> Sounds like a brilliant idea. I quote, looks technically possible. Let's go for it. OK, so this was before I joined the company. So let's talk about me. I have no experience in maintaining ATMs. I have no experience in acquiring ATMs. My only experience of ATMs is withdrawing cash from an ATM. But I do come from a, an InfoSec background, so I started working in InfoSec. Um, I started in computer forensics and then progressed on to working in incident response, dealing specifically with payment card data breaches. So there might be a bit of a tangent there, but there's no direct link as such. I've also worked in threat intel as well, and I've worked with startup companies to help them develop um, analytics on top of the kind of products that they have based on my knowledge base. Um, so I joined Positive in March, which was about a month. I would say probably the idea, the original idea for InfoSec to buy this ATM or to see if it was possible to make an ATM started maybe in December 2016. So I joined in March 2017, and at this point, uh, all of our employees working in the London office had started to explore the idea, but as you can probably guess, it didn't look like it had great legs, because as soon as you start looking into the feasibility of doing something like this, there's lots of hurdles. And this probably tells you a lot about my personality. I decided as a new employee, I was like, no problem. We can do this. I can make it happen. So before we get um, 
stuck into the journey of how I bought an ATM, I just want to talk a little bit of, about the history of ATMs and cash dispensers. So the story goes that John Shepherd Barron went to his bank on a Saturday afternoon and he found that the bank was shut, unfortunately. And he thought, so this was in 19, about 1965, 1966. And he thought, well, that's not very convenient. I want to withdraw cash when the bank is not open. And lucky enough, he owned a company, he was sort of an inventor, he owned a company which um, came up with products and manufactured new products. Um, uh, it was sort of a small company. So he worked on an idea and he brought this idea for the first cash dispenser to Barclays. And it took Barclays and John about a year to develop the first cash dispenser. And this was installed in 1967 in Enfield. And what this looked like is you went into, you still had to go into your bank and they issued you with a voucher, a bit like a check, which allowed you then to insert the voucher into the cash dispenser. You then input a four digit pin and this would give you £10 and this would give you £10 in singular £1 notes. So that was the first cash dispenser. And in the same year, another two cash dispensers were installed in Europe. The first was... Well, I'm not sure of the first, but they were in Sweden, which was by the National Bank in Sweden, and another was by uh, the National Bank of Westminster. And at this point, Evan was developing ATMs independently. So, for example, the one in Westminster was developed by Chubb, which we all know for its locks um, and sort of door hardware. And it wasn't another two years until the US got its first cash dispenser in New York in 1969. Then in 1972, uh, Lloyds uh, installed the first online ATM and that used a mag stripe and it was real time actual dispensing and calculating from your account. So. It wasn't, I mean, in terms of the history, really you're looking at a growth between the 60s and 80s. There was a huge emergence in terms of ATMs. In 1985, Link was formed, which was a conglomerate of um, banking networks. Link is now the largest network of ATMs in the UK. Matrix was formed a year later, and then after, shortly after that, the two networks merged. So now we have in circulation, or Link have in circulation, 70,000 ATMs in the UK. About 75% of the ATMs in the UK are free to use. Uh, so that's a lot of ATMs. And uh, looking at the kind of statistics, it doesn't look like cash is going anywhere that fast. Because in terms of what we do now with ATMs, their roles have evolved a lot more. We're seeing in places like Asia that people do a lot of their banking in an ATM, it has a lot more features than just being able to look at your balance. So the role is, uh, is changing quite a lot and I don't think it's going to go anywhere fast. So let's talk about how you go about buying an ATM. The first thing to do is to identify your market options. <coughs> and for me that was four options. So the first is a legal route, which would be looking at things like maintainers of ATMs, looking at banks, looking at manufacturers. The second option is the grey market. So that's when you're looking at marketplaces where you're not exactly sure of the source of the ATM, how it's been acquired, if it was legal or not. It could be a private seller. It could just be eBay. Black market market's pretty obvious. So that could be dark web or it could be just a marketplace that isn't legal. It's obviously illegal. And then the fourth option for me was a bit of a wild card that was suggested by our CEO, believe it or not, which involved a road trip um, and possible imprisonment for me. <laughs> OK, so let's get stuck into the legal and grey market options. So the first thing that I did when I was looking at buying an ATM was I looked at all the contacts I have in security. And uh, the f what I found is that I still had some contacts in the banking industry, some of which might be in this room today. And so I asked some of those people if they knew how I could obtain an ATM, whether it was possible to lease an ATM from them. And just to give you some background, so 
with regards to positive technologies, we actually carry out ATM assessments regularly, but we didn't have an ATM in the UK, so we had ATMs in other locations, and it's something we've done before, and we'd leased ATMs from manufacturers and banks. So I thought, okay, well, let me see what I can do. Maybe someone can help me that I know. Um, this led to a few people asking internally whether it was possible to lease an ATM to a third party. And of course, there's quite a few legal implications with that. So it led to a bit of a dead end. Um, I also looked at speaking to some of the manufacturers as well, which we'll get on to. But unfortunately, that didn't lead anywhere either. So in terms of manufacturers, so this is something, these are people that you could potentially approach if you have some contacts or some ways in. Uh, predominantly, there's two main manufacturers in Europe and North America, and that's Wincor and NCR. In Asia, there's also Fujitsu and GRG Banking. Um, and just some statistics around ATMs in general, about 80% 80, 80 of the ATMs in circulation are running for some form of Windows XP or Windows Embedded. And then there's just a really small percentage that are running different kind of operating systems. So let's look at the first option. So I explored some options by talking to my contacts and that wasn't very fruitful, unfortunately. But I looked at eBay because um, our PR guy said, you know, this has got to be feasible. We've got to be able to put together some components and find, and find a way to maintain an ATM, which I'd like to say is completely different from uh, hacking an ATM or doing any research on an ATM. Maintaining an ATM is actually quite difficult. So I had a look at eBay over a period of time, probably about a month. So just keep in mind that I joined the company in March of this year. InfoSec is in June. It's not a particularly long lead time. So I was looking at eBay and this popped up. So there was a seller who was selling some kind of medical equipment, but they happened to have an ATM. I thought, OK, great. It looks great. There's a couple of issues with this thing. The safe is locked. It weighs over 800 kilos, and I'm not sure if it works. So how do I solve those issues? So the first one, the safe is locked. Well, I phoned around some friends that I have in security and said, you know, can you help me open a safe? And as it turns out, most of my friends were willing to help me open a safe in one way or another. Uh, the second issue is this thing weighs close to a ton. Okay, so we're coming into some logistical issues here. How do we store it? How do we move it? Uh, it's not, you're not, if I, if I buy this thing, I'm not going to get it in the office. The office we have in the UK um, is in a shared building. It's on the third floor. So I'm pretty sure it's going to go straight through the floor. I'm not sure it's even going to get into the lift. Turns out the lift capacity was 600 kilos. Okay, that's a, a non-stopper. But here's, here's a great turn of events. I happen to live in a warehouse. So, so fortunately, the 800 kilo um, ATM wasn't going to be too much of a problem. Now, the third issue is this machine, I wasn't sure, was in a working condition. But I was able to do a bit of research and contact the company. I obtained their information online and I gave them a call. And it turns out that they have a warehouse of all this equipment they're selling 45 minutes from my house. And I said, can I come and see this thing? I want to work with some of our experts. I need to do a video chat, see if it works or looks like it works. And they said, no problem. This was on a Friday afternoon. No problem. You can come down to the warehouse. Um, but we can't receive you today because we're really busy. You can come and see us on Monday. And they said, we're not open on the weekends, so no one's going to buy it. We'll reserve it for you. I thought, my problems are solved. At least one of my problems are solved. <laughs> Unfortunately, come Monday, uh, this happened. So I looked at eBay and the ending, the listing had ended and it was really suspicious because the listing had gone as removed and unsold. And I was still waiting for the call from this company. So I tried calling them back and speaking to a sales representative and no one wanted to take my call. So it's all seeming a bit strange right now. 
So I email them and they tell me, I'm really sorry, uh, but this has been sold on our website, which seemed really strange because their website looked like it had been made 15 years ago. I said, would you be open to a counter offer? And they told me, go away. <laughs> So it wasn't looking too good for me at this point, and obviously I'd built my hopes up, and I built everyone's hopes up internally. I thought, what am I going to do? Okay, so at this point, I decided the best thing to consider are my black market options. <laughs> yes, as a security professional, I did consider this. So I phoned a few friends and asked them if they knew of any ways that I could acquire an ATM legally or illegally. Unfortunately, or fortunately, no one could help me. So that was the end of that matter. But you yourself might know some dodgier friends. <laughs> it was at this point that the wildcard option emerged. It starts with this email from a colleague who says, I have an idea. Don't worry, we're used to buying ATMs in Moscow. I know that we can buy an ATM for a thousand pounds and courier it from Moscow to London in about seven days. All we need to do, as is clearly indicated in the diagram, is to take the PC and dismantle it from the dispenser. It looks so simple, right? Brilliant idea. Let me know if this is okay as soon as possible. Well, this sounded mad, and it gets more interesting. Shortly after that, our CEO said, well, that's ridiculous. We'll just extend, extend the lease of an ATM we have in Moscow, and you can drive it from Moscow yourself. <laughs> the problem with this idea is that in order to cross over from Russia into Europe, it would require having the ATM probably in all individual components and leaving a rather large deposit at the border. We could potentially stay at the border itself for a week or longer. And I'm a British national and I didn't really fancy my chances dealing with uh, employees working at the border. So I threw that idea out. Or should we say that went to the dogs very quickly. So let's talk about how I legally obtained an ATM. As it turns out, it's much easier to buy an ATM legally than it is illegally. But here are some things that you will need to do. You're going to need to verify yourself as a legitimate company with good reasons to buy an ATM. You need to have a very, very good backstory. In my case, my backstory was pretty close to the truth. I, <laughs> I spoke to two maintainers in the UK. One was Testlink. They are a maintainer and deployer in, UK, in the UK and Europe. And another was SPC International. There are a couple of others, but Teslink and SPC International are the largest. I phoned up Teslink and I spoke to a wonderful lady who said to me, I've worked here for five years and never in that entire time have I ever had anyone inquire about buying a single ATM in your circumstances. So she had some doubts about me, but no problem. I told her, we're a security company. There's nothing to be worried about. We just want an ATM for security testing purposes. We already have ATMs in other locations in the world. We just want one in the UK. And she said, oh, OK, that sounds interesting, but I'll need to check you out. So I had to send her some further information to verify our company. But I will say this is something that you could easily do. You can set yourself up as a limited company. You can have a story. And in fact, when I spoke to SPC in International, they didn't even ask me why I wanted an ATM. They immediately gave me the costs associated with all the models I inquired about. So you might not even need a backstory. But it's just worth knowing is 
Uh, come with a good backstory because someone might ask you what you want with this thing. And of course, they're not used to selling ATMs to individuals. They're used to selling ATMs on bulk to financial institutions. Another thing you need to do is you need to factor in the lead time. So most of these companies will know when they're having certain units shipped in, but it might take several months. So in my case, I had a very specific deadline of June, and I needed to get the ATM as soon as possible so that we could see, A, if it was working, what other work we needed to do on it, and to set it up for demonstration purposes at InfoSang. The other thing to consider in lead time is... Um, depending on the kind of model you're looking for. So there's three different options you have. You can buy an ATM that's brand new, and this is going to cost you somewhere upwards of £20,000. It's not the kind of money I have or our company's willing to spend on an ATM. So the other two options are you can buy a tested model, which is what we went for. And this just means that it probably mostly works. Or you can buy a completely refurbished model. So... That means they've refurbished every aspect of the machine. And if you go for a refurbished model, then you have to factor in lead time. It's going to go into a factory, and they're going to refurbish every aspect of it. Um, as it happened, buying even a tested machine, they had to do quite a lot of work on it. You also really need to know your ATMs. Because even if you have a specific model in mind, and I would suggest going for a freestanding model, uh, Unless you have a specific machine in mind with a specific configuration, you could be lumped with some dinosaur. One of the first things that I was quoted on was a machine which was like Pentium 2. So not too much good for us. So you just need to be aware of what kind of things you want and are necessary to run the machine. Um, and then lastly, you need to think about the logistics. And I will emphasize that all of this, buying an ATM is, a, is completely feasible. I did it in a relatively short period of time. I'm confident anyone else could do it. But the logistics of buying and owning and storing and moving this thing are just an absolute nightmare. It's going to weigh, most models weigh upwards of 600 kilos you're going to find it really hard to find a courier to move this thing. Because guess what? Some of the security is making it immovable, believe it or not. So you need to factor in how you're going to power this thing as well. Your best options in terms of storage are things like a garage, a warehouse, a car park that's covered. But you still need to think about how you're going to power it, which turns out to be a bit of a nightmare. So I went for TestLink, and the other thing that I've discovered when you buy an ATM is that even if you want to buy just a single unit, you have to establish an account with one of these companies, even if you're buying one unit. So you need to establish a credit line with them. So that's another thing to factor in. They won't just let you do a bank transfer. So we had to establish a credit line. I had to talk to our accountant internally and also tell him why we were buying an ATM, which is a very interesting conversation. And as you can see, so if you buy a tested ATM, you can buy something from about 2.5K upwards, which isn't, I mean, it's a lot of money, but it's not that much money, really. So once I'd purchased the ATM, I thought, great, okay, we're going to have it shipped in time. Um, we settled on a delivery date, well, as soon as possible, which turned out to be four or five business days before InfoSec, which was cutting it pretty fine. So let's talk about logistics. So this is all about all the things I discovered about receiving, storing, and moving an ATM. This was my rough expectations of how it would be on delivery day. This was the reality of how it was on delivery day. We tried to put the ATM inside of the building, but unfortunately the floor would have just been completely destroyed. So the courier decided that he wasn't willing to move this pallet into the building. So we ended up having to take receipt of this thing outside in a car park. 
which was not ideal, as you can imagine. Not only that, but the person who delivered the ATM had it on a tail lift, and I'm pretty sure it exceeded the maximum capacity of the tail lift. He was very confident, but it's just something to consider. So I had an ATM in a car park four days before InfoSec, not including the weekend. So the first day wasn't too bad. The sun was shining, and I made friends with um, some of the other businesses downstairs, and I managed to get an extension cable. Don't worry, I bought like an outdoor extension cable. I was thinking ahead. And ran it through their premise outside. That was great, okay. And we had an absolute nightmare in terms of getting this thing working because it turns out there were a few things we overlooked. Like there wasn't a cassette. The cassette holds the money in the dispenser. And we decided for InfoSec that we were going to show an ATM that could jackpot and had custom notes. So we needed to check that the notes wouldn't get shredded through the dispenser because they're custom notes. But we didn't have a cassette, and it was three days before InfoSec. So we managed to turn around and get um, work on getting that ordered. But the weekend rolls around, and just keep dropping it. Where you are is great. This is the reality of owning an ATM, is on the weekend I was lowering a, an extension lead out of a fire exit off the top of a building in London to power an ATM. So it got pretty interesting. And as I said, details really matter when you're buying things like this. You must check every single aspect of the configuration because it has so many different components. And as it turned out, we failed to miss, the, or we, we missed the fact that it didn't have a cassette in it. So, no cassette four days before. And at this point, I would like to present you with a quote from uh, a national treasure, Churchill, which kind of represented the mood at the time, which is, success is not final, failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. And really it was a lot of courage to continue at this point. So let's talk a bit about what you can do with an ATM. So an ATM is made up of uh, a bunch of different components essentially. So at the top you've got the PC and then at the bottom you've got the dispenser which holds a number of cassettes which would hold the money. You obviously have a card reader and a pin pad or an encrypted pin pad, an EPP. And as I discussed, so most of these machines are running a variant of Windows. And in fact, in, in the marketplace, predominantly most of them are running Windows XP, which might be surprising to some of you. Um, and then all of this connects to the bank network somehow. So let's talk about how that works. So in most cases, um, so you've got a few options. You've got a uh, connection through VPN to the bank network or via a satellite or in the case of ATMs which are situated in a branch, they would just connect directly to the core banking. There are four main attack vectors or four main ways that you can hack an ATM. So the first is still the most popular, believe it or not, and that is brute force. And that means physically uh, gaining access to the ATM in some way uh, in order to gain access to the, the vault. And that's where all the money is stored. The second option is exploring um, misconfigurations or vulnerabilities at the OS level. Uh, so that includes things like bypassing the kiosk mode, or taking advantage of some other misconfigurations or utilizing malware. Um, and then the third option is looking at interacting with hardware directly. So you could do something like remove the disk itself. You can connect to the dispenser directly and interact with that and bypass the PC. Uh, you can also uh, bypass hardware VPN as well. And then lastly, um, 
the last attack vector is anything via the network. So you could do something like compromise an administrator's account and VPN into the machine. You can utilize things like malware and so on. So just a brief history on the attacks of ATM. So a lot of people are familiar with Barnaby Jack in 2010. He demonstrated at Black Hat a way to dispense money or like jackpotting essentially. So what he did is he used administrator tools to connect remotely to ATMs and he showed how easy it was to get money out. Um, and then in 2012, we saw the first published uh, black box attack. And what that is, is when you connect directly to the dispenser to force it to push out cash. And then in 2013, we saw the first logical attack doing the same thing. Uh, 2014, uh, I would say Positive, along with a few other companies, started publishing some of the first research on like how you actually carry out security testing against ATMs and how you can configure them securely. So, as you can see from this timeline, I think what might be surprising is I think ATMs are often overlooked in terms of security, and most people aren't that aware of what they look like in terms of how they're put together, what the operating system is, what kind of vulnerabilities are associated with them. They're not actually secure by design. So let's talk about brute force attacks. Okay, so as I said, very, very popular, still the most popular form of attack. So in 2016, in Europe alone, there's 1,604 attacks via this vector, 34 million euro reported loss. So the basic idea is that you want to get access to the vault. And one of the most popular ways of doing that is to take a crowbar to force open the dis um, cash dispenser, so where the money comes out, to push in compressed gas and ignite it. And what it does is it causes the back door of the vault to burst open. Um, another popular way I will demonstrate This is probably a way that most of you imagine brute force attacks to happen, but look at how quickly this occurs. So we've got some nice friendly chaps in balaclavas, making friends with the ATM. They've got some of the doors open, which you think is enough, but they haven't got access to the safe right now, and they don't know how to get access to the safe. So that happened in under a minute, which is pretty fast, but obviously there's a high risk of um, being caught or you, you'd want to outsource that kind of work, let's just say that. <laughs> but it's still surprising, right? That's the, the single largest attack factors on ATMs to this day, even in, in Europe. That still happens all the time. Um, Probably the next most common uh, attack vector is things like malware. So, because compromising a single ATM is not necessarily that fruitful, the best thing to do is to get hold of an entire network of ATMs. So let's talk about some attack vectors at the OS level. So one thing you can do is you can bypass the kiosk mode. And as you can see in this photo, this is my cat Annabelle, who is bypassing the kiosk mode, let's just say that. So the kiosk mode is just like an application that sits on front, in, on top of the operating system. So it's security implemented via obscurity. It's just a window that sits on front, on the front. You can, you can bypass it using things like hotkeys. So often on these um, ATMs, we find that like a lot of the keys or the keyboard might be disabled or there might be some applications running that don't permit you to do certain things, but you can use a combination of keys on your keyboard to bypass kiosk mode. And then you could do something like launch um, Internet Explorer, as is demonstrated in this photo here, and then 
um, you can then access the file system. So that takes a few minutes. Um, another option you have is you can access, this is pretty easy to do if you can access the service area, which is like at the back of the ATM. So there's two doors typically on an ATM, one's to the vault, one's to the service area, which gives you access to the PC. If you can access that, maybe you can connect or you can get a file onto the system and run some malware. And there's a, uh, a library called XFS, which is specific to ATMs, which has an API that you can then interact with any of the components, like the pin pad on the ATM. So that's another common way of compromising an ATM. But with a lot of these attacks, what you'll find is they require um, a combination of attack factors. So maybe you'll need like physical access to something, or maybe you'll need network access, and then you can compromise. Um, you can do something via the operating system. So typically, it's not just a single attack vector. And as I talked about uh, the black box attack, so an example of this is you can see here on the your right hand side um, that this was me working late one night with the Ben and Jerry's kept me going uh, so you can see I've highlighted that's basically uh, the port which connects to the dispenser you can attach like Raspberry Pi or something like that and just interact directly with the dispenser itself forcing it to eject cash um, other things you can do, so this is, involves a bit of a hardware compromise, is the, uh, accessing the peripherals. So here we've also got a photo of how you can drill or you can remove some of the facade, which a lot of people would say isn't very probable, but actually it is quite probable. It happens a lot, and it's really easy to cover up the hole, as you can see, with like a sticker. Sometimes people put like an entirely new plastic facade on the ATM. And then you can access things like... USB ports, for example. And then lastly, so network attacks. So it's really easy in places where they have standalone ATMs. So whether that's like a news agent or, in fact, in a lot of other parts of the world, like Asia specifically, there's lots of freestanding ATMs, which, as you can see, is highlighted in the picture. You can just connect directly to the network. Another option is, as I mentioned, you could potentially um, bribe someone. So we've seen from our research for some of the recent attacks we've seen on ATMs, there's examples of service engineers being bribed, and then people, um, then those people would uh, put a malicious file on the system or give you access to the network in some way. And so here's an update from NCR, which is one of the manufacturers. This was in 2016, talking about this specific attack vector. And what's really interesting, as I said, is that the problem with security or securing an ATM is um, it's difficult to determine where the responsibility lies. So some people would say the responsi responsibility lies entirely with the banks, especially the manufacturers would say that. Their response to most of these attack vectors is, you just need to buy a new ATM. But that's because they're obviously driven by selling as many units as possible. And that doesn't really address uh, this complex issue. And, and most of the times, in order to actually secure an ATM, you have to carry out a proper audit. So it's a very detailed process. It's not like you could just say, oh, you need Windows 7. You know, that will solve it. Oh, you need to do... You just need a new ATM, or you just need like one thing like hardware. You need encryption between these two points. It doesn't really solve the issue. So let's talk about money. So this is a dispenser on the left hand side, and let's talk about. So we've talked a bit about attack factors. So talking about about the kind of money or values you could obtain from an ATM. So you typically have four cassettes in any given unit. In the UK, we now see a lot of ATMs have five pound notes. So you're likely to see some combination of five pounds, 10 pounds, and 20 pound notes in any given machine. Another factor is if you were to attack a machine is 
Um, you need to take into consideration when it might have been last replenished. Sometimes these cassettes are out of, um, out of use as well. And typically you're looking at a maximum of four, uh, 40 notes per transaction. So if you want to compromise an ATM, your best bet is to compromise a network of ATMs so that you can use mules to withdraw a lot of cash because 40 notes is quite limiting. And the other thing to keep in mind, so in a cassette itself, you can get around 2,000 bank notes, which is quite a lot, but that's only when they are brand new, freshly cut notes. And it's more likely to be around 1,800 notes that have been used. So at this point, just to check that you're all still awake, I'd like to put it to the audience and see if anyone can guess how much money could be in an ATM in the UK. Just anyone want to guess how much money? At least one. <laughs> Great guess. Any more guesses? You're about the closest, so it's about, probably you're looking around 100 to 120K, but obviously if you were trying to get money from the machine, as I said, there's lots of factors to consider, including the fact that you can only get around 40 notes out at a time. Um, but what we saw, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the green dispenser attack, so what that utilized is it had malware on uh, a whole network of ATMs and then mules went to the ATMs and they would get a one-time password on their mobile, because obviously you need to control the mules, right, as well, and then put that into the pin pad and then that would dispense money. So that's a way of, of utilizing an entire network. So let's talk about how you can make money with this thing. So if you're going to go to the trouble of buying an ATM and spending a few grand on it, you've got to try and make some money out of it. <coughs> Something really interesting happened when I bought an ATM and put it in a car park. Everyone in the vicinity started asking when they would be able to use the ATM. <laughs> Strangely enough. Something really strange happened when I moved the ATM to my house. I live in a shared, I like have a shared courtyard, and the exact same thing happened. People were asking me when it's going to be in use. And I realized how simple it would be to buy an ATM and put it somewhere and start skimming people's card data. And because it would be my ATM, I could put a camera there and I could record their PIN codes. This was quite shocking to me. Another way, obviously, that I looked at making money out of this thing was eventually I took it to InfoSec, which was an absolute nightmare. So it arrived at 9 o'clock the day before the conference started. And it was a bit of a nightmare maintaining this thing over several days. It was quite sensitive. And then, unfortunately, I had... As I said, the problem of what to do with an ATM afterwards. So it got delivered to outside of my house. Unfortunately, the couriers couldn't get it into my place, so it had to spend a few nights under the stars. But for the first few days, I had good weather. After that, I had to get pretty inventive. So I was utilizing pond liner in order to build a makeshift environment in which I could work on this ATM. My cats thought this was great. <laughs> then I figured out a way to get this ATM into my house, which was great for my next idea of how to make money out of this thing. Unfortunately, as I said before, logistics are a nightmare, and as it turns out, no floor is suitable for having an ATM. This is a concrete floor. It absolutely destroyed my apartment floor. And I also would not recommend moving an 800, like, I think this was 750 kilo ATM in your flip-flops. Don't do it at home. But once I got the ATM into my apartment, um, it turns out that the BBC Click were doing two television shows on cybersecurity 
framed a round black cat, and they wanted to get some potential scenarios that they could document that were visual about security, and we had an ATM, perfect. So thus began the journey of trying to sell the ATM to the BBC, which was really invasive, I have to say. So first of all, they were pretty particular about how this ATM should be positioned in my apartment, which I thought was a bit cheeky, really, given that it was so heavy and so complicated. And their original idea when they came to us and spoke to me was, because it's so heavy and unpredictable, let's just film it outside the BBC studios, which I thought probably wouldn't be very aesthetically pleasing. Anyway, so it's in my apartment. We start going through the process of talking to the production people, and they say, OK, this sounds really interesting, um, but what we need from you in order to get to the next step is we need video footage of you doing this, demonstrating this attack vector, video footage of your apartment, photos of your apartment. We need research about the ATM attack vectors, statistics on all of this stuff. So I get all of this stuff together, which I can tell you was very invasive. And they said, yeah, we want to film your ATM. So the BBC came to film the ATM, and I spoke to Spencer Kelly, and a very nice lady who did the kind of uh, rest of the world program as well. But you might notice on the floor, no one's wearing any shoes. And you might wonder why that is, because my floor was destroyed, so I ended up painting over my floor with normal emulsion just to cover up the holes. It's still destroyed. It still looks really bad. Um, so there was a no shoes rule until filming. And one of the problems with generating media interest is it's actually quite difficult to explain to people in simple terms what the implications are of a security issue. Uh, but it's, it's pretty important, I think, as an industry, we have a responsibility as much as possible to try and communicate that to people who don't understand, or at least to do our best. So a little clip of the BBC click, in case you haven't seen it. I won't play it all. So an attacker has come to the front of the ATM. They've drilled a hole in the front. You can see we can access this USB cable. Right, so inside here, there's something that has a USB port. What's inside here? This is just a normal computer. I'm sure not many people would expect this to just be a normal Windows XP machine. Perhaps not, but it's just a safe with a computer on top. And that resulted in a larger sort of episode, or it was part, part of a larger episode. But the problem with security research of any kind is that when bad things happen, like this, people tend to put you uh, in a position of blame. So unfortunately, shortly after the program aired, I had been to talk to our PR company, and I was walking down the street, and I saw this ATM. And unfortunately, a lot of people thought that um, the person who did this might have been inspired by my video. But my response to that is, of course, there's quite a big difference between a petty thief and a normal person. The motivations are very different, so you would have to have the motivations. This brings me on to my last step of my journey. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Or... The misadventures of an ATM when your boss decides to reduce the weight and make it portable. I would like to remind you that part of the security of the vault lies in the weight of the vault. My boss decided that we should make the ATM more transportable to bring it to security conferences. I didn't exactly agree with this idea, but you know, I said, OK, let's go along with it. So as it turns out, I had first-hand experience in deconstructing every aspect of an ATM, 
including the vault, which as it turns out is made of two metal chassis and steel reinforced concrete. And those are steel fibers you can see there, which it's pretty nasty stuff, and this was all happening outside of my apartment. Not great. And the person that we had doing the work had never done this work before, because who gets hired to dismantle a vault of an ATM, right? It doesn't happen. So they started off using some simple tools and realized it wasn't going to work. So then this happened. Now, that is something that looks like it could be in a Ramstein video. Correct me if I'm wrong. And I might point out that this is the front. That's my front door. I'm in my car because I decided to leave because they spent eight hours on a Saturday with a pneumatic drill. My neighbors were not best pleased, put it that way. And this is what the vault looked like afterwards. So this is down to a single layer of the chassis. So it still has the clips inside it to um, take the railings of the dispenser. This is the current state of the ATM. So you might have noticed that the ATM is not at the security conference because it's still in a process of being maintained. And that's my politician's answer. So it's still to be continued. So what have we learned during this process? <laughs> I like to think that an ATM is a bit like when they do those adverts for rescue dogs, you know? When they say, it's not just for Christmas, it's for life. And that's what I've learned. That's one of the things I've learned. I've also learned that it's particularly, it's much easier to obtain an ATM legally than it is illegally, surprisingly so. Um, some of the downsides of security research, as I told you, is like people will tend to put the blame on you just because you've published information online. It may still have been available. What was really curious about this situation, as I said, is that it would be surprisingly easy to take an ATM and put it in a location and to start whether this was for legitimate purposes of, say, security research or for... Um, the wrong reasons, it'd be really easy to start obtaining people's card data. So it might make an interesting research project to see how many people put their cards into this ATM. And the last thing I would say is I wouldn't recommend going down this road because whilst it's been really interesting and exciting to learn all about ATMs, it is a logistical nightmare and it's like a ball and chain that follows me through my life now. And that concludes my talk. So if you have any questions, please feel free. Um, um, are you using the ATM you had got on your phone with? Sorry? Are you still using are you using what purpose are you using? Um using it for demonstration purposes of how you can hack an ATM. Uh, at security conferences or for media. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Um, I honestly don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't actually know, but it's just, like, as I said, it, it made me realize how much of an interesting research project it would be, because that's people's first response is like, oh, when's it going to be working? Like, I can get cash out of it, which is not what you'd expect, because clearly the person working on an ATM in the middle of a car park is not doing it as, like, a financial institution or anything. So it's a very strange response. I don't know the answer. I'd have to look into it. Yeah? Um, I think it weighs about 400 kilos. Yeah, so there's still quite a bit of weight, but it can now be moved with two people. I don't think it's as stable for transportation, so there's some other downsides to that, which is actually you get a lot of stability from having a vault. And, of course, it's not meant to be transported. It's meant to be in situ. So... 
you know, that's just my opinion. <laughs> what do you mean to steal it? Uh, <laughs> well, the ATM <laughs> with, without money in it. <laughs> but currently, the, door, the back door is open. The door um, to the dispenser is open, and it's in, a, in, in an office location. It's not, not yet. Uh, there was a question at the back. Yeah, right at the back. Yeah, so you said at the start that the security rules have been designed from the start. So these are actually going to be from an IPS, IBS, or anything to stop people from coming in and working immediately, or is it the value in? Um, so there's a couple of things. So the specific ATM that I was demonstrating for BBC Click was running Windows XP, which has plug and play functionality enabled. So you, it's all really securing an ATM is all in the configuration, to be honest. There's also a uh, piece of software that runs on some of these machines called application, uh, what is that application core? And it's kind of like a whitelisting thing that says like certain things can't be run, but it's easy to bypass that. So you have to take like a really in-depth look at how that machine's configured, how it's connected to the network and everything. Uh, yep. Uh, because uh, Classic XFS has a Java-based API, do you think it would be possible to, uh, for example, leverage some kind of aspect of the Java file? I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. I can find out for you. There's a question to my right. Yeah? Did anybody take your research on the ATM then? Or um, so seriously? Or? So this is a really good question. So our company has an agreement with Wincor, and we discuss the vulnerabilities that we find with them. Um, we're really open about that, and they use some of that information to carry out uh, some of their own testing. NCR are less friendly towards us, shall we say, and uh, publicly and privately. So we've tried to have a lot of com uh, conversations with them, even in the last year, about things, and they kind of don't want to know. Well, uh, the lesson is that the onus is basically on whoever buys the thing and, you know, don't listen to the vendors about how you need to buy a new ATM because there's no reason why that machine that's running Windows XP without encryption between the dispenser and the um, PC can't be secure. You can make it secure. There's solutions like you can get a device which costs about 150 quid that monitors the current between the PC and the dispenser to detect whether it's been interrupted. You can configure, you know, you can lock it down a lot. So the answer is not just buying a new ATM. Any more question right at the back? Um, so I only have one right now. But did, did it have any mechanism to be updated over the network, or was it? Uh, uh, what in terms? What aspects of it? The, the Windows XP machine. So, but which? So you could potentially update some aspects of it for sure. Um, but so in terms of a, from a security perspective, so some of the software that might be running on the machine that would be updated. Um, what we what we've seen. In, in terms of doing our research or working with banks is a lot of the times when it is shipped with software that, for example, looks at what kind of applications are running, that will be shipped and not updated after shipment is, is what we've seen. Does that help to answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? Do any of the ATMs have explosive cartridges on the bank? <laughs> Well, um, so you can get specific cassettes which have different security mechanisms. So yes, that, that's one option. So some of the, um, there are companies which ship like specific cassettes with mechanisms that aren't just ink, which allow them to be tracked, yeah. If, I mean, is, is brute force something you're going for? <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it sounds like, I mean, you mentioned stealing. <laughs> Stealing the ATM I have and also explosive ink, so <laughs> thank you.